Sure. Um, so first, I don't know as though I had an opportunity to speak with everyone individually yet, so I'll just uh, briefly talk a little bit about my background. Um, I'm kind of a Massachusetts native, uh, born and raised in Massachusetts, um, much more on the North Shore, uh, but work brought me down to this region. Um, our only break in that was I spent about two and a half years in Panama in my early years and ended up um, starting kindergarten in a bilingual school there. Um, came back to the United States, unfortunately forgot all of my <laughs> Spanish because my friends didn't understand why I was speaking a couple of different languages um, back and forth without really knowing which language I was in um, but I went on and I just had some opportunities in music um, I had a wonderful music teacher in high school who really was one of the people I still actually communicate with today off and on she's now actually a superintendent of schools um, and she was really one of the people in my life that, that just really changed how I looked at education and what I valued and so I ended up um, going on in the field of music education. Um, briefly thought I wanted to teach college, so I got a degree in music performance. Um, and as I was finishing that up quickly, also realized that wasn't for me and it was really about teaching kids. Um, so I ended up in Franklin um, on a whim. I was hired there as a long-term substitute about halfway through a school year. It was my last semester of graduate school. And um, I remember talking to the dean of my school at the time and saying a job opened up in Franklin and if you start there, you never know where a job will take you, maybe I'll get a full-time job, and uh, 20 years later, I, I'm <laughs> you know, working there as an assistant superintendent to schools, so it's been a wonderful ride in Franklin. Um, had a variety of, of roles um, as a teacher uh, at the middle and high school level, but also a K-12 uh, director of music, and then as a high school administrator, principal, and then um, now as the assistant superintendent. Um, you know, Hopkinton, you know, I first heard of Hopkinton because we had a family friend where our cottage is, um, and she happened to live in Hopkinton. And so she's someone that I've known since I was a child. Um, she was actually a very close friend of my older sister's um, when she was growing up, and you know, still lives in Hopkinton to this day. Um, and, you know, we see each other through the summer. So I always kind of knew of Hopkinton as a community, and then when we moved here for my work, um, in Franklin after school it was a community that was still relatively close and I continued to drive through and it was a community that um, we had enough interest in to the point where when we were purchasing our our most recent home we actually looked at some homes in Hopkinton um, and were considering moving there so it clearly was a community I had a lot of interest in on a personal level um, we didn't didn't end up buying a home here um, however um, as a high school principal in Franklin, it was always a community that um, you kind of looked at and, and knew just the value of education was there. So that was kind of my initial interest in Hopkinton. And then, you know, as I was preparing for interviews, I, I did a lot of research on the community, obviously. And um, part of that research was watching some school committee meetings. And I distinctly remember the moment that I, I, I decided that this was a community I had a high level of interest in was as I was watching one of your meetings, a, a really hot topic of busing at the elementary level um, and kind of being able to provide that opportunity to um, children of families who might be going to different daycares after school um, came up as a discussion point and at the time I didn't know how it ended um, I since have gained a little more insight but um, what struck me in the discussion that I think in many communities could have deteriorated into kind of a difficult discussion um, really remained respectful the whole time and as I heard from community members who came up um, and started their discussions with you with we have the utmost respect for the administration we understand why the administration might make this proposal um, but we want to just share our perspective on what it means to be a parent in 2018 or 2017 as opposed to maybe a number of years ago um, and some of the challenges around that um, your interactions with the parents, your interactions with the administration, vice versa, the administration's interactions with different groups. It, it was just a really respectful discussion, and I think that's something that really sealed my interest in the community. Um, you know, I'd love to say it's because of numbers and data and how well Hopkinton performs and everything, but um, I think sometimes life is actually more than that, and it's about the right fit. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, I just really look for a respectful environment, and I thought it was a wonderful testament to the community and the values. So. That was kind of why Hopkinton. Um, you know, to kind of come back a little bit to 
told me and some of my core values that I'd like to share with you, and I hope through the interview process I can highlight some of these with you tonight. Um, one of my core values is trust and accountability, and sometimes those seem that if you're developing trusting relationships, accountability can seem a little opposed to that, but um, accountability is transparency, and it's also leadership accountability back to the people you're leading, um, the community you're leading, the students you're leading, the faculty and administration that you're leading. So I think those are important. Um, I hope that as you do the site visit, um, on Friday of this week. Those are some real themes that you hear from the people that I work most closely with, from our students to our parents to our uh, faculty and administration. I think um, one small example of, of how I try to build that trust and accountability in some of my meetings, um, particularly with our social emotional team and our counselors and psychologist meetings as I started to work with them over the last two years, I try to make sure that as I'm conducting meetings, at the end of a meeting I actually build in an opportunity for participants to give me feedback about the meeting and I think that's just an example um, but I wanted to give at least a concrete example of how I try to bring some of that core value into action. Um, my second set of core values are really achievement and innovation. Um, and I think we can continually increase achievement through innovation. Um, some examples I'm hoping to give you tonight, um, first and foremost, is my focus on the quality and effectiveness of classroom teachers. I think it's the primary driver of achievement um, for students. And I think any research that you look at um, and you know, meta-analyses of, of different uh, instructional methodologies tells you that it all comes down to the effectiveness and skill set of our classroom teachers. So some things that I've had an opportunity to do over my time in Franklin, um, work on educator evaluation, and we've done some significant work on that, and hopefully we get to talk about that a little tonight, but also we're in the process of developing a peer coaching model that <coughs> is designed um, to um, pick up where our mentoring and induction program leaves off, but continue that development of teachers through their, throughout their professional career, um, and also provide the leadership opportunities to our most exemplary teachers to be able to work with classroom teachers to continue that innovative process. So we're piloting that at our elementary school. Uh, this year, we're finishing up the planning of it right now, um, and that's a group of teachers I have an opportunity to lead. To lead. Um, on a curricular side, you know, I've been able to help implement a one-to-one -one program uh, at our high school, but then also finish our transition to Google at the district level uh, over the past year. That's been um, one of my responsibilities. Um, and then also on the curricular side at the high school, I was able to work with our staff to develop and implement an arts academy which is a 9 through 12 program that's interdisciplinary approach to education. And then we also were able to really look at our science program as we built our new high school, and we introduced a whole STEM education program uh, within the science department that was focused on robotics, forensic science, um, bioengineering. Uh, we have an exercise physiology program and kind of a continuum of, of classes within that. Um, and then we also were able to introduce some of our computer science from beginning to AP courses. So. I think that hopefully speaks to some examples that can make tangible meaning out of the, that core value of the achievement and innovation. And then the last core value I want to talk to you about is equity. And I think, um, just to illustrate that a little bit without going on too long, you know, equity takes, you know, two areas of focus for me. One is about access um, and providing access to all students to uh, really curriculum that's challenging and relevant to them. And then the second is about cultural proficiency. And the work that I do in Franklin, um, I think as a principal, I worked very closely with our special education director, and I continue to do that on a daily basis. We're in communication in my role. Uh, we were able to implement a full co-teaching program at Franklin High School. Um, and I knew we had made it when in the third year I walked into one of our classrooms and it was a co-taught classroom and it was, we only have one level of college preparatory curriculum and we had students with very significant disabilities in the class with students who did not have disabilities in the class. And I believe it was Hamlet that they were working on, but it might have been Midsummer Night's Dream. I can't quite remember that detail because it's irrelevant. Um, but the class was grouped into multiple groups uh, based on readiness in this class and there was two groups who were actually working on the original text um, from Shakespeare. There was a second group that the co-teaching pair had actually rewritten the text um, so that students could access it at their level of reading. And then the third group uh, of students were actually uh, watching a video of Shakespeare. And all students met the standards, all students engaged in the same level of discussion, 
and it was just a wonderful moment when you knew you had made it as a teacher. Um, I remember distinctly walking in and the, the content teacher was actually standing on a desk wearing a Burger King hat um, <laughs> at the time. Uh, but uh, it was one of those moments that you really look back on and, and stays with you. Um, we also were able to implement some really nice programs. We brought in Unified Track, which has now expanded into Unified Basketball as well. Um, the highlight of my year every year as the principal of the high school was the moment when our uh, athletes returned from Special Olympics. And we typically had maybe 15, 16 athletes participating in Special Olympics um, from our high school. And when they returned, we brought the entire high school out onto the front plaza of our school. Um, and everyone formed you know, a big line, greeted them, uh, cheering. The police came in uh, with the sirens blazing uh, and just the appreciation from our whole school for what this group of students had achieved was astounding and it, it, it still chokes me up talking about it. So uh, really just a, a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And then in terms of cultural proficiency, that's really a goal of ours in Franklin. I happen to be the civil rights coordinator um, and we've been able to, I. I, I think over the last year or so, do some really creative and innovative things around cultural proficiency for ourselves. Um, we did see a number of incidents creeping up where we recognized a lot of bias um, within our community. Um, and we were able to regroup as an administrative team over the summer, and this was part of my role as an assistant superintendent, was to lead a group of administrators and develop a series of administrative protocols for responding to hate. Um, and we were able to use some references from the Southern Poverty Law Center to guide our work, but we, we really developed some Franklin-specific protocols for how we wanted to publicly respond to hate incidents. We then um, moved that forward another step and developed a letter of inclusivity. Uh, which we did as an entire administrative team and all 36 of us signed and sent out at the beginning of the school year around our values of inclusivity um, within the Franklin community as a, a bold statement of what we wanted for our schools. Um, and then also over the last year, in terms of equity, we were able to revise our dress code because um, at one of our school committee meetings, we saw some language in our, our student handbooks that some of our school committee members recognized as maybe biased a little bit um, based on gender. And so we actually held a number of community forums, worked with our administrative team, and came up with a new dress code policy. So I hope that, I know it's a little bit long, but I, I don't want to be a person who comes in and talks about core values without actually giving you some concrete examples of those that, that you can take with you and understand that I, I hope that I live the, those values because I, I feel like I do. So thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So as you know, Hopkinton is a community that really invests in education uh, and that as a community, we're really proud of what we've accomplished so far. Uh, but looking ahead down the road to where we're going, what is your vision for the district? What would you vision for our future? Well, you know, I think that it's it's difficult to say what's my vision for Hopkinton um, because I think as part of uh, any responsible entry process, the first step in developing a cohesive vision is for a superintendent to have a very clear entry plan that includes not only the data analysis associated with that, but it also includes um, a series of forums with all stakeholders, from students to parents, community members, faculty, administration, and then taking back the information you're hearing and validating that back with some of your key constituents to make sure that what you think you're hearing and seeing um, is also an understood perception um, and that you're not making false impressions. I think at that point you're then ready to start making some findings and choose some specific areas to move forward. What I, I, I can tell you that I value where I think education should go in general. Um, I think we're in an era that we want to focus on how our curriculum can be more and more relevant to our students. And I think that that's achieved through increased personalization. Um, I saw, and I, I can't remember the program, but I saw a wonderful pilot um, at Hopkins School while I was there where they were using some technology to personalize learning and make sure that it was meeting the needs of a variety of students in the classroom. I thought that was a wonderful example of that. Um, I think I talked already a little bit about some of my examples um, from my time in Franklin of looking to personalize learning, whether it's through our Arts Academy um, or through some of the science programs and STEM programs that we developed. But I think that, you know, the I, I have always long thought, and my faculty would attest to this, that I've, I've said that MCAS is our minimum standard for graduation um, and that 
any effective school and district is hoping for students to achieve a lot more than that and really to do that we need to make sure that each and every student who walks through our doors in the morning feels like the curriculum is relevant for them and is helping that student achieve what they want out of life so I think that's one of my the elements of a vision that I would put forward is relevant curriculum and personalized curriculum I think a second element of a vision that I have is ensuring that there's an effective system of supports in place for any student um, I think that effective systems of support um, fall into a tiered model where you have the types of experiences that all students have within your district and that um, meet the needs of many many of your students I think then you need to have a system of supports for students that don't necessarily meet benchmarks whether they're you know um, academic social or emotional benchmarks you need to have a system of supports that any school and any teacher feels comfortable putting in place um, for that set of students um, within a regular education setting. I think beyond that, you need to have a really effective system of special education supports um, or supports that are arrived at through some sort of an evaluation. Um, so it may or may not be special education, but really maybe more in-depth evaluation of, a, of a, a subset of students to make sure that their needs are being met. Um, and then beyond that I think it's also working with your community to make sure that there's a system of supports beyond what schools can offer um, I think we're headed into budget times um, that schools are not going to be able to necessarily do everything that we hope we could do um, for each and every person that comes to us but I think by working with some of the various community partnerships we're able to ensure that there's a continuum from where school ends at 205 or 305 or whatever time it ends until um, students go home at night um, and in the community so you know I think um, we're actually working in Franklin a little bit now around trying to develop some supports for parents through various partnerships we have um, with outside agencies as well to help support parents in understanding the needs of their students and finding other services outside of the schools to meet those needs so I think you know those are probably my primary two tenets um, are that idea of you know personalized relevant curriculum and systems of supports to help ensure that all students are able to access that curriculum um, so you actually led into my next question a little bit when you mm -hmm. talked about the, the budget piece. Um, budget building is obviously an important part of the superintendent's role. Our budget typically makes up about 52% of the overall town budget. Mm -hmm. So as, um, as a superintendent, how would you collaborate with um, other town boards and departments um, given the constraints of municipal budgeting to ensure that there's a responsible budget created that advances the school district? Sure. Um, you know, I can, I think that the collaboration with the town departments is essential. I think um, I, I've seen communities and I've, it, at times even in my community where budgets have gotten tight and some of the conversation around budgeting deteriorates into who's more important. Um, and I think that in my experience, that's kind of been the death knell of Gather, garnering community support to be able to move a budget forward. I think that um, number one, and I'm going to come back right to trust and accountability in a budget process is a core value. You need to be transparent in your budgeting process and you need to make sure that your budget tells the story of what you're trying to achieve as you present that. Um, the And you have to garner a sense of trust within your overall community that when you go to them, people know that the tax dollars that they're working hard every day to raise are going to garner improved student achievement um, and I think and they're they're also being spent wisely um, and I think that means um, making sure that you're requesting things that are actually necessary um, and not requesting things that you know um, people view as, as extraneous to, to what's really necessary to educate students um, and I think if you have an item that you're placing into a budget that could be perceived as extraneous you're really making sure you take the time to explain that to your community um, and I think that your school committee meetings are a great opportunity for that um, in how you choose to present 
um, to the school committee is a wonderful opportunity to talk directly to your community. But then I think, and I know we do this in Franklin because um, the community I'm coming from is, you know, in the bottom 5% of districts um, in terms of funding around the state, but in the top 15% in performance. So, you know, we were on a return on investment um, national study from a, a fairly conservative group as one of the hallmarks of communities that get the most return on investment, which is sometimes not really the list that you want to be on um, <laughs> <laughs> because you have to, you know, really not spend a lot on education. Um, but I think, you know, we're constantly talking with our town administrator um, about available resources. We do a lot of work. Um, in terms of like looking at health insurance options and we enlist our town administration and look at um, all of the various you know collective bargaining units within the community and we have an insurance advisory commission which I think many communities do um, but annually we're looking at plan options and trying to work with the different unions so that we can constantly negotiate plan options so that we're not facing you know 10 percent increases in health insurance but we can try and keep that you know and I hate to say in health insurance terms but to a reasonable you know seven or eight percent um, increase but um, you know I think some of those fixed costs are really not sustainable over time and if you can't work effectively with your town administration for some of those combined costs um, and then also obviously working with your staff and your, your different bargaining units to you know make sure that what you, you want to continue to provide great benefits to people because that's what attracts and maintains people but you also have to do it in a fiscally responsible way so I think you know um, we do a lot of collaboration around that we also um, unfortunately because our operating budget is so tight sometimes we're actually purchasing some of our instructional materials and texts through a capital process as opposed to an operating budget which um, is you know not necessarily the the most ideal of situations but it it gets the resources that we need in a, a slightly different way um, hope that gives you at least a couple of concrete examples Absolutely. of some ways we work together um. So can you tell us what you think the greatest challenges your district has faced or is facing in the area of special education? And how have you worked with your team to make improvements with it? And how do you envision the role of the superintendent in addressing these challenges? Sure. Um, I, I think that probably the greatest challenge for us is and this is so based on the context of the district sure. um, but the greatest challenge for us is going to be to continue to support our co-teaching model that we've implemented and we've really worked hard probably over a better part of eight years to make that a K through 12 initiative um, because it's it's a very expensive model of special education delivery um, but it's also produced some incredible student gains um, over the course of doing that and even beyond that morally we feel like it's the right thing to do for kids to provide all kids access to that high rigorous curriculum um, but I think that's going to be a challenge that comes up as a sustainability of um, special education models uh, because the main driver of a lot of our budgets is going to be personnel um, and between salary increases insurance costs um, and then for us post you know post employment benefits um, and OPEB is a major driver of our town budget as well um, but I, I think that that's going to be a key challenge but then I think one of the opportunities that as a superintendent you have is to to work with your special education director to look at opportunities to develop programs within your district that help return students who might otherwise be placed out of district um, out of district costs uh, typically are going up you know three to five percent in any given year and that's an unsustainable budget number for students um, and you know what we never want to do is let the conversation about a district cost deteriorate into why are certain students burdening a district because that can also happen as part of that discussion if it's not treated with some sensitivity because we are morally obligated to provide every student the education that they need um, in the most free and appropriate environment I think um, I also think from a philosophical standpoint we want our kids in their home district to the extent that we can meet their educational needs and if as a superintendent you can work with your special education director to 
really look at um, cohorts of students with similar disabilities and learning profiles and do a cost-benefit analysis of trying to return students to the home district if that means providing a program that might have a primary teacher with some assistance um, to be able to support that 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 can be a really positive move to provide strong education keep a student within their com home community and control budget costs um, that you can then allocate to other areas um, I also think special ed transportation costs are a real driver. Um, you know, I, I certainly don't know enough about Hopkinton's special ed transportation um, to be able to make any conclusions, but I know that, you know, we're constantly looking at, you know, how can we increase our in-district capacity for special ed transportation so that we're not having to use contracted services because the contracted services are very, very expensive and, again, kind of fall into that unsustainable realm. So I think um, I've talked about this before. As a superintendent, I think, A, you are the primary educational leader of your district and you are helping to provide the vision for what types of programs you want for students um, and how you want those programs executed through how you conduct yourself. Um, but I also think as a superintendent, you're able to help other people look for maybe some financial opportunities where you can streamline costs and then reallocate those costs to be able to do more with your in-district resources. So hopefully that gets to the heart of that. Um, my question has to do um, with the sort of shifting demographics in our town. We're in a period of pretty s significant sustained growth. Um, so what do you see as the challenging aspects of an increasingly diverse community? And um, what kind of leadership efforts do you think you are needed to encourage us to celebrate that um, excellence through diversity? Um. Can I just ask you to repeat that one more time? I sure. want to make sure I'm really no, getting to the absolutely. essence of that and not um, jumping to conclusions. First, what do you think are the most challenging aspects of an increasingly diverse community? Okay. Um, that's what I wanted. I, I heard the growth element, and I heard the diverse element, right. and I think there's a couple different challenges associated go, with right, that. Exactly. I wanted to make sure I was keying in on what you were looking for. Um, this is something that um, I think I've actually had pretty significant experience with in, in my community. Um, we, for a long time, were one of the fastest growing communities in the state uh, for probably a period of about 10 years. And um, what we have seen um, is increasing diversity within our schools and where I think, I, I know I've definitely talked with other groups, so I apologize if this sounds redundant. Um, but we've seen you know quite a few issues of maybe some um, conflict between you know kind of the established group within our community and maybe some newer groups that are coming into the community that aren't aren't as understood um, the we are actually working on a multi-year initiative on inclusive schools um, as a result of that and we're doing a number of different things um, as strategies one from a curricular standpoint is to look at the types of literature that we're exposing our students to and make sure that they reflect the community that we have in, in Franklin. Um, our principals have been wonderful um, working with our curriculum director, um, assistant superintendent for curriculum to take a hard look at some of the literature. But I also know that as we've experienced some of our um, bias-based incidents, I'm often talking with our principals about the type of education we want to provide as a result of that and it's constantly going back to the literature that principals are either ordering to bring into classrooms hold grade level meetings hold whole school meetings um, and and focus on that concept of diversity um, and appreciation of cultures the I think we also have worked at our middle level to implement um, the ADL's a World of Difference program, um, which is, again, in direct response to the increasing diversity in the community um, and the Inclusive Schools Initiative. Our middle school principals have been absolutely wonderful, and it's been an exciting, exciting model um, because through that, our seventh grade uh, students right now are able to apply to be peer leaders in the ADL model, and they actually have gone through a whole series of training, and this spring they're going to be delivering um, 
lessons and facilitating peer discussions around inclusivity um, and appreciation of cultural diversity. So that's a strategy we've implemented at the middle level and at the high school level, um, We've done a couple different things. The high school principal um, has actually taken some steps to have flags that represent all of the different uh, cultures within the school and displays those um, in the high school so students can appreciate the cultural diversity of the school. We're also planning, once we've implemented ADL um, programming at the middle level this year, we're actually moving that into our high school next year. Um, you know, kind of concurrent with that, we're also taking an approach that we want to make sure that if people have concerns within our schools, whether they're faculty, staff, students, or parents, that if they raise a concern with us, we're also responding appropriately and making sure that we do a thorough investigation of that type of an issue. Um, and then, you know, really make sure that we're following up with those people and families to report out our findings. Um, and what we found is, you know, we're seeing increasing reports of bias incidents um, over the last probably two years and that's something that I think we had to have a conversation with ourselves that if we took that seriously we needed to then make sure that we did the work to thoroughly investigate um, report back findings create effective support plans for people that may need them um, you know schools are a microcosm of the world and we're seeing bias incidents in schools. We're seeing um, incidents of sexual harassment in the schools. Um, and I think one of our commitments as an administrative team was to come to an understanding that we're not going to be judged by the absence of these issues in schools. We're going to be judged by how we choose to respond to the issues in schools and the proactive steps that we take. Um, you know, I think. I talked a little bit at the beginning about the development of you know a series of administrative protocols for responding to hate incidents um, the idea of sending out a letter of inclusivity that um, we actually developed as a team I know I'm going to be giving that to you as a writing sample uh, later so you can you can review that but it was a pretty powerful letter I think not to toot our own horn um, but the power in the letter doesn't necessarily come from the words on the page it comes from the multitude of you know the two or three pages of signatures that come at the end of that and really setting a united front um, because as leaders I think uh, what the administrative team needs to understand is as the leaders of schools everyone looks to us for how we're going to respond and talk about bias and cultural sensitivity um, I just I think it's incredibly important it's been probably the major focus of my work over the last year or so um, and it, it's it, I'll tell you it's the most challenging work I have ever done in my life um, and has led to the most you know difficult conversations we've had to have and you know getting to core values and beliefs of others and you know really having to listen a lot to people and understand that when you're listening you're really it's not a technical conversation it's an emotional conversation um, every day is a challenge when working with some of these issues but it, it the end of the day I can also go home and say it's some of the most important work I think I've engaged in because it again coming back to we're here to make sure that each and every student and each and every family that comes through our doors feels as though we're here for them um, and that they are a valued member of our community so um, I, I feel like maybe I got a little bit off on some of that response but hopefully it, it, oh, it came is. back around yeah. thank you that's a good segue into my question, which I'm going to also incorporate a little bit of a follow-up to what you just said. So um, the superintendent is both a leader of educators and a leader in the community. So um, if you could speak a little bit to what you think your areas of strength are in both of those arenas as well as areas of growth, but if you could sort of include in that response um, a little bit about how have you extended the work that you're doing in terms of um, changing demographics, the work that you're doing in the school, has there been outreach across the community and bringing the community kind of into that conversation? Okay. So I slipped an extra one in there. <laughs> There's a lot to that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, if you saw me on TV, you know I'm wordy. <laughs> um, I think I already talked to that. I, I really truly believe the superintendent is the primary educational leader of the district. Mm -hmm. um, and you know of course as I'm thinking of the quote it's slipping my mind but it, it it's the quote that we all know in education about how you know we really create the weather mm -hmm. um, through our actions um, and I cannot for the life of me now that the moment of truth is upon me remember who that is attributed to so I apologize um, but I think that it, 
areas of strength and growth, I, I maybe have a little bit different perspective on. I, I don't, when I talk to people about areas of strength and growth, um, I think it's so uh, targeted to the area that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for me, um, two years ago, uh, when I entered the role, civil rights and um, equity were on my mind, but maybe more from a special education perspective and not so much as a cultural perspective because those weren't the issues we were facing as a community. Um, and so I think out of necessity though, it's been the area that I've spent the most time in professional development on over the last couple of years because I felt like if I needed to lead that work, I needed to make sure that I really understood what I was leading. So um, I, that's been probably the steepest area of growth for me um, along with social emotional learning over the last two years but um, I, I really work hard to try to be prepared um, for what I do um, I certainly don't ever claim to be an expert um, on any one thing I don't think as a superintendent of schools you are the expert on everything um, the only thing I think that the superintendent should be an expert on is leadership um, and kind of the study of leadership and, and what it means to lead people and um, help people achieve great things so you know, with that said, um, we do a lot of work in our community, and I think my work in bringing people to together the community, I'll give you some different examples. Um, actually, one that's probably germane to kind of the issues of that we're, we're talking about in this part of the interview. Um, when we were um, working through our really thinking forward to our next NEASC evaluation, which is now done. Um, we started some core values work at our high school because we had long had a mission statement um, and it was something that you hung on a wall and then, you know, 10 years later you revisited and, and updated. Uh, and we, we really felt like we needed to be more driven by a set of values. And we actually took about six months um, of time to develop a set of core values for our high school. And we ended up with over a thousand participants that participated face to face with us um, through that process. We had um, a core values leadership team that we developed and put in place um, that included representatives from our school committee, central office, high school administration, teaching staff, students, uh, and parents, and, and actually community members as well. So we, A, developing a leadership team for something that includes representation from all stakeholders, I think is key to leading an initiative. I think that we then um, provided focus groups and had some strategies in place to solicit feedback within a structured context. And you know, so for example, we had a business leader and politician focus group, and we invited a number of our local business leaders um, and politicians within our community to come and provide us feedback. And we simply asked every single group, Franklin High School students are successful when and then we allowed them to fill in the blanks. Um, we then went through a process with each of our groups to have them place values on the different um, criteria that had come up and then we actually turned it over to our students and they took the core values. Um, we did a major data analysis project around this and I happened to have someone on my staff who was exceptional in that realm so I turned it over to him for a little while. He came back with a lot of data. We then turned it over to our students. They looked at the data and they actually developed the set of core values um, that we then adopted um, and we brought to our school committee to, to really kind of formalize the adoption process. So I think that is one of the more proud moments I had as a principal, uh, really engaging the broader community and developing a shared vision for what we wanted for our students. But um, you know, in, in the new role, one of my focuses is actually on community partnerships right now. Uh, because as I said before, I don't think schools are able to do everything anymore for students. And I think we need to engage the community in that. Um, one group that I have going right now is a substance abuse task force. And we started that about halfway through the year last year. And we have students, we have um, parents, we have community members, we have a safe coalition in Franklin. I don't know if anyone has heard of that, but they're really a very, very active uh, coalition um, that's also a community organization um, to try and combat the opioid epidemic. Um, we have our, one of our local state reps actually comes. Um, we have, just, just, it's, it's growing by the day, our police are there, um, our school physician attends, our school nursing leader attends, our wellness staff 
is part of that, central office staff, special ed director, really a broad, broad coalition. And what we've actually found is that as we've worked longer, we're having more people join from our community. So a couple things have come out of that. One, we did a major revision to our substance abuse policy, um, and we started with our substance abuse task force to make recommendations to our policy subcommittee of the school committee, which we then moved forward and, and adopted a new um, substance abuse policy. And then we are currently actually working on the community side of things. And, um, you know, the, the focus of the uh, one of our subcommittees in the task force right now is actually developing resources to better educate parents of younger children and provide them strategies that um, they can use to, in the angle that we're taking because we have our rec director involved for the community um, is that we want to help parents utilize the 20 to 40 minutes that they're spending in the car coming home from an athletic event um, to start conversations that build resiliency and talk about substance abuse with younger students because we're finding that waiting till middle school is too late um, to start a lot of these conversations, especially in terms of building resiliency. So that I think is an example of one way that we've really used our community partnerships to leverage something that you know is a school issue, but it's also just a life issue for, for kids. Um, I also work with the School Wellness Advisory Council, um, and that's one of the, the groups that I chair, and we're really able to outreach with our local YMCA as a major community partner in that. And right now we're implementing a food backpack program for one of our high needs um, schools where they have a, a fairly high number of food insecure families. And the backpack program, um, we're working to develop we have a long-standing relationship with the Franklin Food Pantry, but what we're working to do is use the YMCA and Franklin Food Pantry and our own internal staff to be able to provide food backpacks where students on a Friday afternoon could go into a private location like the nurse's office, pick up a backpack for the weekend, and it provides them some essential food supply that they can bring home for their family. So, um, again, it's really trying to look at ways we can leverage the the different resources within the community to, to provide that level of support and access for our kids. So um, did that get yes, to the question? It's another good. one you had a lot of parts to I that, know. and I want to make sure I'm <laughs> complex. Thank you. really answering. So I want to talk a little bit about risks and risks that you've taken. And wondered if you could share two risks that you've taken as an educational leader, one that worked out well and one that did not work out as well as you had hoped, and what you learned from that. Sure. Um, so we went through a major building project um, where we built a new high school. And you know, as a principal of a school during a building project, you're often pulled out of the building quite a bit. Um, and so our building project you know, was about a two year project. And I was very, very heavily involved in that. So I, I feel like I wasn't in the high school as much as I needed to be. And you know, also at the same time, we, we're asking faculty to move and change a lot of the practices that they had. Um, they had to change classrooms. We implemented educator evaluation mm -hmm. during the same time period. <laughs> we actually chose not to start an ESC visit during then, thankfully. Um, but then at the same time, we also had a couple of really difficult personnel issues um, with some very veteran, well-respected faculty um, where they could no longer be with us. Um, and they were, they were some really sad issues, but as the principal, you're, you know, it, it was a time that when I look back on, I wasn't available to my faculty enough as the principal of the building because I was being pulled in too many directions. Um, and we were asking too much of them at the time. And, you know, as someone who values the idea of trust and accountability, um, that was probably the element that hurt the most when I, I had, you know, some of my faculty coming and saying to me, hey, we've got a morale problem, we've got a culture problem. Um, and it took, it, it took me a long time to really be able to unpack what that meant. Um, what we ended up doing, um, I, I, you know, A, we met as an administrative team at the high school to really talk about how we wanted to approach it as a team because I think a lot of that work has to be done as a team. Um, what we, and then I also reached out to some friends that I have in the education world and, and kind of processed it with them, some kind of trusted colleagues. Um, we ended up actually asking all of our faculty to write for an entire faculty meeting. Just talk about the culture of the school write it all down, it's anonymous, and you tell us everything that's on your mind about culture and morale. 
um, as a principal uh, you know I had a big school I had 160 teachers or roughly that and I read all 160 responses um, and it was one of the most difficult challenges that I had to really sit and read and understand what teachers were experiencing in the school um, and, and then along the lines of the concept of accountability we had to then come back to the teachers with something as a result of that because you can't just have people write and think that there's a, a solution on the way um, we ended up developing um, kind of a culture leadership team within the school that we allowed faculty to elect members to um, and we met for the better part of a year um, and throughout the course of that we allowed that discussion a to better understand the nature of what school culture is because what we found is everyone had kind of a wildly different version um, everything from kind of congeniality to collegiality um, were were views of culture and happiness and um, collaboration and just we weren't focused as a school on what culture needed to be um, but through that we did about a year-long study of culture um, with the leadership team and did a lot of surveying of faculty and staff through that and we ended up taking a number of steps as a result of that um, around communication around transparency around um, we had some questions again it was about the time we were implementing educator eval and they what they had questions about the language different administrators were using we had to look at some of our own practices as administrators and the impact that those were having um, on the school but it's something that really set the school in the right direction uh, moving forward and it took you know probably my last two years of the school to really start to see that progress but it certainly went off in the right direction um, it wasn't done and I know the current administration continues that work but it was it was one of those areas where you know you kind of got pulled in too many directions mm -hmm. and you know in hindsight I think you know you you took your eye off the prize for a few minutes and, and that really shouldn't happen um, you know I think it, it certainly isn't the most proud moment of my my educational career um, but again I think if, if you go and you, you're gonna be able to talk to some of our faculty and staff um, I, I think that I still have very good relationships with them and I think you know it was really me being able to stand up to them as a leader and say hey you know I took my eye off the prize I, we need to get this back and moving forward and and that engenders a lot of trust too um, when a leader can be vulnerable um, to people I think I think that's important as well so um, I, I, it's kind of one example but it's an example of a failure and then <laughs> trying to move something forward um, but I, I think it was probably also professionally one of the best learning experiences I had great thank you sure thank you. Yeah, one more. Um, so, um, actually, why don't you go with, yeah, let's go with, um, what, what's the role of the superintendent in the classroom, and how do you identify um, excellent teaching and learning? Um, the role of the superintendent in the classroom, um, I'm going to come back to the superintendent is the primary educational leader of the district, um, and that cannot be delegated to anyone, um, nor should it be delegated to anyone. Um, but that requires a lot of collaboration I think um, you know one thing I did in transitioning into my new role um, I when I became the assistant superintendent I actually made an effort that I in got to every school and I think I got to every school on an average of about 10 times over my first year um, as the assistant superintendent and as part of that I met with each principal for about an hour and then the principal and I walked classrooms in the building for about an hour and we would use the first hour as kind of a collaborative problem-solving model what were they working on um, did they have staff members that they were trying to work specifically with around teaching practices and providing appropriate supports to the staff member um, but then we would actually walk and talk um, and look at instruction and calibrate our own expectations and I think as the superintendent of schools it's incredibly important to be able to spend that face time with your building principals and your administrators because I think identifying effective instruction um, and making sure that there's a shared vision of that from pre-k through 12 is one of the most important roles of the superintendent that you have um, you know teacher evaluation is incredibly important work um, and providing the right supports and professional development to teachers is also incredibly important work but without 
the shared vision of what great teaching looks like, those things can happen in isolation. Um, and they can be haphazard and, and not implemented. I don't mean that Hopkinton is at all. <laughs> Clearly, from the way you perform, it's not. Um, and from what I saw in the brief time I was able to be in classrooms, it was just you know really, really incredible teaching and learning. Um, teachers were passionate about what they did. Um, the the uh, fourth and fifth grade students that gave us the tour um, were amazing to, to listen to and their enthusiasm for what they were doing. Um, but I think that you know, the number one thing when I walk into a classroom, whether I'm a building administrator or an assistant superintendent or a superintendent, it's going right over to kids and talking to kids about what they're learning um, and having kids explain to you what they're learning, um, having kids articulate the importance of what they're learning to where they're going in life. Um, it goes back to that idea of making sure curriculum is relevant to them um, and that they understand what's happening. Um, teachers need a lot of leeway to them employ whatever instructional practices they think are meeting the needs of their kids. But what I tend to focus on as an instructional leader are A, do kids understand what they're learning? Do they understand the importance of what they're learning and is it connected to the real world? And do kids, are kids meeting the expectations and do they really, is there evidence of learning? Um, and my most powerful conversations with principals and with teachers have always been around what's the evidence of the learning um, and how do we know that the student is learning and then the best conversations with teachers are always around when you see a student who's not learning at the level you expect them to what did you do as a result of that and how did you modify your instruction to meet that student's needs um, it it's teaching is incredibly complex um, and by keeping the focus on what students are doing and what students learn, I think a superintendent's able to make sure principals are also doing the same with teachers and that teachers are focused on student outcomes as opposed to just their own practice um, because we implement different practices and different strategies to make sure that kids are actually learning. So that, that would probably be my focus as, as a superintendent is, is laying out that vision, establishing consistency with the administrative team, making sure we're all working to the same pace. Um, one thing we did, um, uh, I started the work at the high school and then I ended up finishing it as the assistant superintendent. We published district-wide. We found that our teachers across the district felt that our administrators maybe had some slightly different expectations of teaching and we were hearing that from our association. We were hearing it from individual teachers um, and we had actually, we probably did six years of professional development as an administrative team beginning with educator evaluation um, to the point that we had a, a coach coming in from Teachers 21 who worked with our administrative team on a monthly basis with professional development and then actually walked the buildings with the administrators, did shared observations. And the feedback we were getting from them is they had never seen such consistent expectations of teaching and learning across the district, mm -hmm. but we were hearing from our teachers there was inconsistency. Um, what we came to understand um, by kind of really probing was that when we were talking with teachers about instruction, we were not using consistent language for how we approached those conversations. And so again, it was kind of the, the skills were there, but the impact we were having was inconsistent because it was perceived in different ways. So we actually developed kind of um, a model observation template where we had some specific consistent language that all administrators agreed to use across the district so that if a teacher saw something that was a commendation, they knew what a commendation was. If, say, say, if an administrator made a suggestion, there was a clear definition of what a suggestion was. Um, we had a clear definition of what a recommendation then was, and we had a clear definition of what a requirement was. Um, and but. We found that, again, it engendered a lot of trust from our faculty when we were able to clarify our expectations for teachers as an administrative team. So again, I think as a superintendent, you're working with the administrators to make sure that expectations are consistent, that there's a clear vision for teaching and learning, and that they're implementing that um, in classrooms on a daily basis with their faculty. Thank you. Sure. So is there, do you have questions for us that we can answer, or are there, is there something that you wished we had asked you that we, we overlooked? Um, no, I, I don't know as though there's anything um, that you didn't ask or, or um, anything like that. I think, you know, I, I 
hope I could just end maybe talking to you, kind of come back to why Hopkinton again. I think, um, you know, I started the process um, having a little bit of knowledge about Hopkinton. Um, I was able to clearly before my first interview do some research on the community. Um, prior to the full day in the district on Monday, I actually spent, you know, better part of Sunday driving around the community. Um, everything from looking at the new housing developments to looking at some of the historic areas um, of Hopkinton to just really get a flavor for the community. Um, and then I was able to spend the day on Monday. And, you know, I'm a person that I, I like doing the data work, but I try and also bring a very humanistic approach to how I make decisions. And it went from, you know, knowing that from a kind of outside perspective that Hopkinton was a really strong community to really developing that gut feel um, at the end. And I had, you know, someone who I was close to in education always said it made their big toe wiggle. Or they, they had a feeling for something. Um, and and it, it, it's a community that I think, at least from my standpoint, um, I felt like this was a really good fit um, from the level of respect to some of the issues um, that, I feel like I heard from a variety of constituent groups and was able to synthesize a little bit um, at the community forum. Um, they actually asked me, you know, what, what issues do you see that you need to work on in Hopkinton? And I said, whoa, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's slow down. Um, I'm not going to talk to you about what I need to work on, but let me talk to you instead about what I think I'm hearing, at least from the, you know, couple dozen or so people I've met um, and maybe synthesize some of the, what I think I'm hearing. Um, and it felt just, it's a very comfortable um, place. And I think, at least from my end, it, it's one of the places that I, 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 I certainly really hope that this ends up being the, the job for me. But I also know that um, there's a process in place for a reason. And as important it is for me to feel comfortable in the community, it's equally important to make sure that you as representative of the community think that I'm the right fit at the right time in the right place. Um, and that if either of those aren't in sync, it's just not the right right time. So I appreciate your roles. I know you have a challenging decision. Um, I appreciate also all of the time that you've taken through the process. It's a very thorough process, um, but also all the time that your faculty and administration and community has taken to be able to meet with all of the candidates. I think, it, again, it comes back to me. It's just a real testament to your community, and you know, I, I just want to leave by thanking you for that. So Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. It was very nice to have you. I'll walk you back out. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Peter, right. for coming Good in. Good luck Thank with the you. rest of the process. Thank you very much.